Hello, friends. This is Jeff Elliott, and who are you? I'm Julia Rodriguez Elliott. Julia so. Rodriguez Elliott. We're <laughs> the producing artistic directors of A Noise Within. Most of the people watching this probably know us. This is our Fridays at 5. Uh, it's our way of staying connected with you, hopefully offering up some interesting things for you to uh, listen to, be a part of, and enjoy. And it's just a way to stay connected until we can finally be in the same room again and give each other a big hug. We are all looking forward to that. We hope you're all uh, staying healthy and safe. We have a great group of uh, artists today. We're really, really excited. And uh, we wanna introduce our director of uh, cultural programming who is going to moderate the conversation today. So Jonathan Munoz Pru. Jonathan, take it away. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thrilled to share this virtual space with you all. Um, my name is Jonathan Munoz Pru. I am the Director of Cultural Programming, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I first want to begin by acknowledging that A Noise Within is uh, located on the traditional lands of the Gabri Gabrielino Tongva Nation and offer our gratitude uh, to uh, the Gabrielino nation tribe. Um, and also I'm zooming in from San Diego on Kunyai land uh, while I'm sheltering in place. Um, so welcome, welcome to our Fridays at Five that we're calling this week Black Arts Leaders and the Ground on Which We Stand. So I'm thrilled to uh, begin this conversation. And I think now we'll bring on our panelists and begin introduction. So I'd love to invite in Nancy Cheryl Davis from Town Street Theater. Malik Elamine from Grio Theater, Abdullah Hall from the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles, and Yvonne Huffley from Lower Depth Theater. So we're gonna begin by inviting each of our panelists to offer an introduction of what their theater's mission is and what their theater's connection is to A Noise Within because we uh, at a and are grateful to have uh, begun uh, collaborations, relationships with each of these organizations. So welcome, you amazing humans. And why don't we begin with Malik? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, in order to tell you about Griot Theater, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I came to Los Angeles some years ago as an actor first. I'd done an MBA program, uh, MFA program. Um, I'd done regional theater across the world and had come here excited to tackle television and film. About a month after I arrived, I started to lose my hearing, um, first on one side and then on the other. Um, what I found in losing my hearing was that it wasn't more difficult to act. It was incredibly more difficult to get hired to act. And so that was a great loss for me. Uh, back in 2010, I ended up receiving a cochlear implant, which is this. So when I take it off, I can't hear. But when I put it back on, it gives me my sound back. And when I got my sound back, I felt like I got a superpower. I felt like I could do anything. And so the question was, if you can do anything, what would it be? And for me, the answer was to create a place for other artists who, because of their gender, their ethnicity, or their disability, did not get similar chances at other theaters. And so that's how we created Griot Theater. Uh, and, and that's what we do. Um, we focus on both reimagining classical work and um, creating a new work by those voices. We wanna give voice to these kind of untold stories. Uh, in, in terms of our collaboration with The Noise Within, uh, we had something what we called New Voices Festivals, where we would do live uh, stage readings in order to explore texts that we might wanna put on stage uh, a little further down the road. So we collaborated with The Noise Within uh, to explore two texts. One was called A Hit Dog Will Holler by Inda Craig Galvin, uh, and the other one uh, was Here or There uh, by Jennifer Maisel. And so we, we got an opportunity to put both of those texts up on their feet um, with actors going through the steps and, and with audiences, and it was, um, it was a really exciting journey. Uh, I shared, uh, just a little bit ago, I shared another part of that journey, so I'll share it with the audience here. Uh, after we did those stage readings, uh, Jonathan invited me to the opening night performance of Frankenstein, I attended, it was a reception afterward. And uh, at that reception, I met a woman who, um, who is now my wife. We just got married a couple of weeks ago. So I, I have other reasons to be grateful uh, for the collaboration with The Noise Within. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Malik. Nancy, welcome. 
Thank you. Thanks, everybody, uh, for coming, tuning in. Hello to all. Uh, the Town Street Theater was founded 27 years ago, 1993. We were founded actually after the 1992 incident uh, with Rodney King. And um, our mission is to produce, create, and develop primarily work by African American playwrights and others. And um, we have uh, also a, um, a uh, some poetry program. We have a couple of programs. Um, for 15 years, we had a musical theater camp for kids that was um, uh, led by my co-founder, Nancy Renee. I should say uh, my other, our other co-founder is my husband, um, Nathaniel Bellamy. So another kind of theater love story. And, um, and we do main stage productions. We um, have, again, the Sun Poetry Program, which is um, uh, spoken word. We also do a Black Classics uh, series, uh, which is to do works that are not normally done. We don't do August Wilson. Um, I'm glad you guys are doing it. Uh, we do uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson. Uh, we've done work by Steve Carter, people that um, are not as familiar in the uh, American theater canon to um, many audiences. Um, we also have a literary series program where we do excerpts of novels um, uh, by mainly authors of color. Um, we've done Octavia Butler um, and many other uh, wonderful books. Um, we are a company of, we used to be a company of three. We're about 27 now. And um, our Noise Within uh, collaboration was last August, I believe. And it was a wonderful play by one of our member playwrights, Ladarian Williams, called Concrete Rose, about uh, the 15th, uh, not the 15th, it's going to be the 15th anniversary of uh, Hurricane Katrina. The play was about Hurricane Katrina. We were scheduled to do the play this fall because it was the 15th anniversary, but of course we can't do it, so we have to push it back. And that's um, how we landed here with the noise within. Thank you, Nancy. I just want to acknowledge that August was so busy with developing new work. I mean, <laughs> the two of you, uh, both of your companies, three projects in development, and we had uh, many, many more. So that was a we, we really launched that fall uh, off strong. Abdullah, welcome. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you all for having me here among these amazing panelists. My name is Abdullah Hall. You can call me Abby. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am the artistic director of the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles, the premier chorus made up of trans men, trans women, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary individuals, and we lift the trans community out of victimhood to victorious through song. So that is what we do. And we did a great collaboration with The Noise Within called Trans Sister Radio, um, along with Michael Shepard of the Celebration Theater. And I'm so happy to be here to lend voice among this amazing panel today. Thanks, Abby. And, and actually, Trans Sister Radio was one of the very first Noise Now events in, in spring of 2019. I think it was the, the third official event, maybe the yeah. fourth. Um, but, but one of my favorite memories was uh, we actually, I think we started the show late because there was such a line of patrons at the Glitter Bar because we were offering people a, a free like a session with an artist to get basically glitter and gems and rhinestones on their face and it was such a party so thrilled to have you have you back with us yvonne you. welcome you're muted sorry about that that is the part that i always forget on these things is when i mute myself <laughs> Uh, hello again, my name is Yvonne Huffley and I'm with uh, Lower Depth Theater. Uh, we started our theater company, maybe it's been about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, it was a group of artists who were trying to find a, a, a place where we could express ourselves through any form of theater that we wanted, contemporary, the classics, new works. Um, and it, it was kind of born out of a frustration and out of an anger uh, of, of making space, which looking at August Wilson's speech, some of what we experienced came out of that. Um, 
in terms of programming, uh, in, in the beginning, we really did try to focus on um, adapting new works, working with classics that are told through the eye of a, of a, of a Black person. Um, and now we've been really focusing on our commission series um, and working with new playwrights. We've worked a lot with the National New Play Network. Uh, we have a commission series called The Cycle of Violence. And it is a space where we decide what are the things that we want to talk about. And then we find the playwrights to help us talk about those things. Um, one of the things that we did with The Noise Within is they were so gracious and they gave us space at their uh, beautiful upstairs space uh, in order to um, work on Safe Harbor, which is a play about uh, which is a play about um, children being sex trafficked. And so it was a wonderful time to be there. We felt very, very, very supported. And in one of the other programs that we did there, we were able to put on a stage reading of uh, Day of Absence, which is a very, very old play out of New York. Um, and it basically deals with the day all the white people uh, disappeared and Black, the white people are wondering where are all the black people and it's black people in white face wondering where everyone is. And it was a really wonderful time to introduce these classic plays to the a noise with an audience. Thank you so much, Yvonne. I, I remember, I think it was like a week before I started in this position uh, in, in fall 2018, I saw, um, I hope I get the name right, the Black Album, the, the one act uh, uh, plays oh, Lord yeah. presented. And I, I, I don't remember all of their names, but but I, I, it was, I was so passionate about finding a way to how do we partner with Day of Absence and Dutchman. And I, I was thrilled that we found a, a way to partner on that. So welcome everyone. Um, so the title of, of this conversation is Black Arts Leaders and the Ground on Which We Stand. Um, so for those who, who don't recognize um, what those words are echoing, um, they reference a speech that playwright August Wilson made on June 26th, 1996, called The Ground on Which I Stand at the Theater Communications Group National Conference. And folks in the theater have been talking about this speech for, for decades, uh, but there's especially a lot of talk about this speech today. Um, there is from some, uh, I, a lot of frustration that we're talking about the same challenges that this speech addressed in 1996. So we wanted to take some time to lift up some of the, the issues and conversations addressed in that speech and explore how they're still resonating today and how they should still remain top priority today. And one of those issues that I wanted to lift up first was this conversation about colorblind casting or color conscious casting, or there are a million different ways to discuss this. But I wonder, Malik, if you could start us off and, and share your thoughts about why it was so important to lift up this conversation and give some time to addressing this. Sure, thanks, John. Um, it, it's, it, I just wanna highlight a couple of things you've already said, which is that he, he wrote the speech in 1996. So uh, here we are um, almost 25 years later and some of the things, many of the things that he wrote about are still, it's as though he could have written it last week, um, which, which is telling in, in a lot of ways. Something that's specifically about colorblind casting, because August Wilson, so for example, is not a proponent of colorblind casting and makes an argument um, around that in, in, the, uh, in the speech. Uh, but he also talks about the, the, the phrase, which I thought, um, I was only hearing recently, and apparently this was happening in 1996 as well, uh, the idea of, of people using the phrase, I don't see color. Um, and so we talked about those together. I don't see color and colorblind casting. Uh, and, and what Wilson said and, and what I, I would say today is that when we say I don't see color, I think many people feel that that means that they are a forward thinker and progressive and um and not racist um but for people of color it it, it often feels like one is saying i don't see you uh, because my my cultural background my ethnic background is a part of who i am uh it's a part of uh, how i walk through the world and to pretend that it's not there 
um, is is to to not acknowledge and 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 see me. Um, so you also mentioned the phrase colorblind casting versus color conscious casting, and I think those are also very different things. Um, colorblind casting, in the traditional sense, means that we essentially ignore um, the ethnicity of the bodies that we see on stage, and we do that so that. And a person can play a father who doesn't look like they came, that they were the father of the child, or the sister and brother can be different ethnicities, and we just kind of ignore the fact that there are different ethnicities. Um, I, I think when we talk about color conscious casting, well, I would just say being intentional about ethnicity and, and race when we cast a show non-traditionally is what I am a proponent of. So I talked about um, reimagining the classics. And for me, you don't just throw different people in different roles up in the air and see what lands. You, you, you've cast intentionally and say, if I'm doing Julius Caesar, what happens if Caesar is black and Mark Antony is black and all of the proponents of Caesar are black and the people who are conspiring against him are of a dif different ethnicity? then we're doing something with race and ethnicity that still speaks to the struggles and the themes of the play. So we're exploring the text in a different way, um, but we're not doing it blind to the fact of the bodies that we have on stage. Um, and so when I talk about it, I talk about it as being intentional because another way when we say if we're, we're colorblind again, we could actually be uh, perpetuating stereotypes that are negative because we haven't paid attention to the fact that oh, we made the drunk the black character or we made the prostitute the Latino character and we made the professor or the politician white. So we have to be conscious of race and ethnicity when we're choosing a play and when we're casting it. Um, I'll pause there and, and see if any of the other panelists wanted to chime in. Thank you, Malik. Anyone want to offer to that or expand on that? Um, I would. Um, that's an excellent point in terms of it being intentional and that it makes sense for the play. Um, because if it doesn't make sense for the play, then it takes people completely out. And it was interesting. I had not read um, that speech in some time, and I read it, reread it again today. Um, and it also brought to mind about, um, was it Katori Hall's uh, mountaintop just recently? Was it last year or so um, when a white actor, uh, it was a, a school production, I believe. And, you know, they were going to have a white actor play Martin Luther King. <laughs> and that is not a good idea. Um, so that goes to that whole thing of colorblind casting that doesn't make sense in that realm. Um, at Town Street, we have a very diverse group of artists. In addition to African-American artists, we have many different types of artists. And when we're doing roles that are specific to the race of the character, we keep them that way. When it's something different, say, for example, our 10-minute play festival, um, which we actually were going to do right before everything got shut down. Um, it, a lot of times we ask people to submit things that can be, um, can be cast by anybody. Um, we can use anybody in the cast, you know, uh, male 25, woman 40. So that's a different kind of thing. It doesn't have that moment in that space. I mean, and then um, the world of television and film it's always interesting, as you were saying about, you know, um, I don't know if you mean television and film, but across the board, the, you know, the person of color plays the prostitute. I played a lot of prostitutes when I was younger anyway. And um, it's, it's something that we need to switch that narrative. Why can't the person of color play the executive in any um, platform across uh, the boards, you know, be it uh, film, television, or theater. Please, Abdullah. Yes, I want to piggyback off of that um, because my experience besides running the trans course of Los Angeles, I was at Paramount Pictures for 20 years. And so it's very interesting that 
everybody has jumped on this bandwagon of this all of a sudden, well, everybody, mostly predominantly our white citizens of America have jumped on this bandwagon of um, conscientiousness when it comes to film, television, and theater. For example, there's a big controversy about all the white characters that have been portraying black roles in animation. And they're now saying, we're gonna release these jobs and we're gonna open up that space for a black actor to do those voices. Unless you're a black actor like me, who their whole life has heard, you don't sound black enough, even doing production with people. So you gotta listen to the double talk that Hollywood has given us right now. Cree Summers, who's an amazing actress, amazing live actress and voiceover actress, did the voice of Penny and many white characters. It came down to the job of the voiceover. And I think rather than saying we wanna just open up this, this tokenized space for black to do this and black to do that, we as artists, in my opinion, just want it to be open for us to audition and get those roles and people to suspend their animation and, and, and their thought process of who should be playing this role. When I was a kid, one of the things that inspired me to go into the arts was I lived in Philadelphia and I saw a, a version of Diary of Anne Frank done at University of Penn and Anne Frank was Asian. It did not dawn on me this Asian woman was playing Anne Frank until the Q&A time. And I love that they were bold enough. I was like 14, 15 years old. They were bold enough to do that. And I think that there's, there's this bias that people see in theater and live performances, even in the choral world when it comes to Black artists, even trans-identified artists. I run the Trans Chorus of Los Angeles. Most trans-identified choruses are TTBB, tenor, tenor, bass, baritone. Our chorus is the only chorus that has soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Most people think a soprano is going to be identifiably female. Our sopranos, one's male, one's female. It's these gender markers that are in music and the same thing that within acting, whether it's film, television, these colorisms that prevent us from getting these works and seeing these amazing things and opening up opportunities for these artists to do that. Our job is to just act and do, but we've had so many layers of systemic racism running the theater company, running the, the orchestras, running the courses, where they feel that there are no black voices there. And I've been challenging people in the choral spectrum that when you get an artist to come and audition and they sound too gospel-y or too black for you, to for you to think they can't do a piece by Mozart or Brahms or Beethoven, you have a bias. And it's up to all of us that are in these positions like us on this panel to really challenge our boards and others to say, you need to check your bias of what you think a black performer can do because they probably can do a lot more than you're giving them. And this whole colorblind casting, after working at a studio, hearing that over and over and over again, what it boils down to is them picking one or two of us still to this day, one or two that fits that mold. And what I really would like to see is just in a way, open casting for that performer to be there, for that actor to be there and look beyond my color. And I know that's kind of a, a fantasy world right now, but really that's what I really, really, really would love to do. Unless it's a historical piece, then that's one thing. But Hamilton has even shaken that up a lot. You know, you're taking all these historical figures and making them black and Latin and women and, and it's blowing people's minds, but that's our job as artists, to blow their minds and to show them that diversity, show them that being Black artists is not a monolith, and really come on and support us at our theaters, at our concerts, at our choral structures, and just let go of what you think 
it should be. Um, somebody mentioned traditional theater. And the sad thing is we've been so convinced that traditional theater is all white that we sometimes remove ourselves or allow ourselves to be removed from that table. But that's just me. So anybody else, go for it. Thank you, Abby. Yvonne, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, when I, I reread the, I reread his speech and um, one of the things that I took out of it is that colorblind casting, what he, to me, like I'm an actress, right? So for me, trying to get a job was like, oh my God, please open colorblind class because I want a job. You know what I mean? And so really for me, he was coming from the perspective of people who are making the decisions, who are making the choices. That the, 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 the detriment of colorblind casting um, silences the voices of, the, of, of those black voices, of those voices of whatever color it is that you would like to pick. Um, because then it doesn't really serve their, how, how are they really expanding their knowledge of the kinds of stories that they're telling and who is at the center of the story? Um, and so I, I know that there, there were other, you know, I, once I reread it and I started reading all these other things about what other people thought about it. And um, to me, for instance, at Lower Depth, I don't know that we ever had this idea that we were going to uh, colorblind cast when it came to classics. Instead, we found plays um, because we have an appreciation for the classics. The first play that we ever did was uh, Three Sisters After Chekhov by Mustafa Matura, which is a reimagination of uh, Anton Chekhov's story. And so what we connected to, which is, is that ground that we all walk on, we connected to the humanity, we connected to um, these three sisters trying to figure out in uh, uh, colonial Caribbean how to survive. Um, and I think that colorblind casting gives us incremental change. What I would like to see is institutional change. And I really think that the only way that that happens is, um, is by putting our stories at the center of, of every, of, of putting black voices, Asian voices, Latino voices, uh, LGBT, LGBTQIA voices, at the center of the story, then, um, you know, colorblind casting is really just a band-aid. And I can understand why August Wilson said, no white people will play, be, play my characters because that's not who he meant it for, right? That's not, and it's, and that should be respected in the way that he wants to tell those stories. Um, but it is rather a band-aid than it is um, real change. I, I certainly believe that theater is universal and, and a huge part of theater is recognizing our shared humanity. And I think it can be really um, dangerous when it's always or more frequently up to communities and people of color to find the shared humanity in white stories or stories uh, from a white perspective. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's about time that we find more equity and balance in, in white folks, seeing the shared humanity and the universal themes in uh, stories written by and for and about people of color. And I wanna read, um, I'm so inspired by everything you're offering. And I, I've got this speech right here. I wanna read a, a quote that I think connects uh, to what I'm hearing you all say. It's a little different, but I'd love to get your, your point of view about this. August Wilson says, to mount an all black production of a death of a salesman or any other play conceived for white actors as an investigation of the human condition through the specifics of white culture is to deny us our own humanity, our own history, and the need to make our own investigations from the cultural ground on which we stand as black Americans. It is an assault on our presence and our difficult but honorable history in America. And it is an insult to our intelligence, to our playwrights, and our many and varied contributions to the society and the world at large. I wonder if anyone wants to, to just <laughs> react. To so I am going to humbly, partially <laughs> disagree with our elder August Wilson. Please, please. <laughs> because I understand the spirit in which he's said what he has. Um, if you have a zero-sum zero game and 
the choices are to do these plays by white authors and put black bodies in those plays, or to make space for these black voices to tell stories that are specific to them. I think that's the place from which he's coming. Um, I think there were also some shows that are more specific to culture um, and, um, and point of view in that way. I don't think that that is an across the board uh, reality. And, and as an example, um, a, a few years ago, Grio Theater did a play called An Accident. It was written by a white woman. I'm sure when she imagined it, she imagined it. It's a two, two, uh, two character play. I'm sure she imagined it to be two white people dealing with one another. There wasn't anything in the script that necessarily suggested that they had to be two white people. So when Griot Theater did that play, because I, I loved the, the, the themes and the story and the characters and the language, Griot Theater did that play and we cast two black uh, actors in those roles. And um, one of the comments that I got a couple of different times from black audiences is that one, they loved the play, they thought it was touching, they thought it was funny, and they said it was so interesting to see a play with black people that wasn't about being black. Um, we need all of that. We need plays that are specific to our culture and specific to our politics. It's also really interesting to see our bodies in these other plays that just speak to some other themes and some other things. So I, I would say there's some text where if you cast black actors in the text, you're kind of fighting with the text. It's like the words that they're saying or the references that they make don't make sense with the bodies you see on stage. I don't think that's every play. So I think a decision like that has to be approached from that standpoint of consciousness. Look at what it does to the play when you put these bodies in the character in, in the, on the stage versus when you put these bodies. And if you're fighting against the text, then you don't do that. But I think there are a lot of opportunities where you can do it and you're not fighting against the text. Abby, yes, are you ready? Or, or whoever wants to take it, jump in. <laughs> jump in, I don't know. Okay, I'll be back. Um, uh, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Rereading that, you know, is interesting. I graduated from uh, ACT. And of course, when you graduate from someplace like that, you know, you come out and you're like, I want to play everything, you know, because you're taught in that environment that you can play and do anything you want to do. Um, and then you come in the real world and you find out that it's not the truth, um, which is quite an eye opener and disappointing, you know, because you know, why can't, again, black people do the classics? Um, I remember auditioning for a, uh, a uh, um, it was Cat on the Hot Tin Roof down in San Diego, um, all black version of Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. And they had some rights issues and uh, this back and forth with, again, I believe the state of Tennessee Williams, um, was he gonna allow it or not? Um, so it does depend strongly on the text. And the thing that just breaking off for a minute that I really want to get in because reading this article again and reading the, um, the information about Asia, which was the African Grove Institute of the Arts that came out of this speech um, that was a national movement to grow black theaters. And I was part of the LA branch. And unfortunately it didn't come to fruition because we talk about what we want other people to do, but what we have to do is we have to do it for ourselves as well. I mean, to have, you know, to read that, that speech and, you know, the, the hope for black institutions, for small theaters, for big theaters, to have the funding, you know, to actually sustain, to uh, reading one of the comments from Dr. Victor Walker, who was one of the um, founders of Asia with August Wilson, and about saying, you know, if you're in it, you're in it for the long game. And the hope that we would have been further along in our own institutional strengthening and building, which takes money, which goes into a whole nother 
uh, sequence. So sorry, I know we're running short, but I just, it was something that was just bothering me so much. It almost made me want to cry actually, because that was written 19 years ago, uh, 25 years ago. And then the Agia uh, formation was 19, you know? And so it's, it's personal. So sorry, I got off, I got off on a tangent, sorry. Not at all, thank you, Abby. So what's so amazing, I, to bounce back with what Malik just said, I just rewatched the documentary on Netflix on August Wilson and something Lawrence Fishburne said that was very telling, he said, August never did his plays at the Apollo. He was on Broadway. He was on the Great White Way. Um, he never took it to an all black area or anything like that. And I, 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 on that part, I, I agree with what Malik just said about how those words that are resonant in this speech are a little bit of that time because we're not a monolith. We are, it's so expansive right now in our expression of who we are as black people. We are, whether it's from your own expression as a black person, whether your gender is involved, whether your politics are involved and your artistry all being involved, all wrapped up into one big thing. I think the biggest thing is really people supporting those artists of color that are out there doing this and telling those different stories. Like my stories that I tell and write and use with my chorus is so diverse because I didn't grow up in all black America. I didn't grow up in all white America. My America is everybody. And we are at the beginning stages of that true America because the laws that afford us to have this amazing panel are only 57 years old. So when you look at it in that context, it's kind of mind blowing that we've made this progression, but folks feel we're going backwards, but we've made a lot of, of strides and this is, we're still at the baby stages. And in the artistry of like, where it comes with Black artists doing what they do, I think the biggest thing, in my opinion, is just having the opportunity to be there, to do those classics. None of us were alive during Shakespeare. Not one of us know if Shakespeare had a real person who was a Moor that played Othello, or was it somebody in Blackface? None of us. It's all of us kind of questioning that. Or if, if they had colorblind casting back then, we don't know because the history has been told in a very specific way. But I think we should dig a little bit deeper and open up way, way more opportunities. When I talk to patrons and I talk to other people, my world is the choral world right now. So when I look at the choral structure of America through gala courses, which is the amalgamation of over 600 LGBTQ choruses in America, and the ACDA, which is the American Choral Directors Association, which is thousands, and I look on there and I look for Black representation in classical music is disappointing because the numbers are very, very, very low. I'm in a group where there's 600 choruses and there's five Black artistic directors in America. But why is that, I ask? Is it because you feel that, or others feel that everything is gonna sound gospelly? Is it because you feel that black folks can't sing opera and classical music like they thought with Porgy and Bess? When Porgy and Bess came along, they thought blacks could not do opera. And so Gershwin did that operetta to prove that it could happen. But in that, I realized that while we're talking about this and talking about color conscious casting and color blind casting, this is a conversation that has gone on for more than a millennia of artists worldwide of color in the roles that we are relocated to. And I think that we're right now at the beginning of those things changing. I think that, um, is it Tanya Pinkins that's doing Mother Courage right now? I 
or it was going to before COVID. No, I, I know she was going to do it a few years ago, and there was there was a, a big conversation about that. And I just read her recent essay, which was tremendous. Thank you, Nancy, for recommending it. Yeah, that essay was amazing, and just just to know that we all studied um, studied acting. It, for example, we look at the old actors like you know, um, Bea Richards or a Hattie McDaniel or a Butterfly McQueen who were, or, or um, Burt Williams, who was known as like the Black Charlie Chaplin. These were actors who were well-versed in acting, Shakespearean trained and amazing, who were doing roles that were relegated to them during those times of early Hollywood vaudeville and stage. And sometimes we look back at that and we think of it as a negative. But I look at all those artists as adding so much to the conversation of, of artistic measures of Black people and how still we are fighting to just have the opportunity to be seen as artists in every single role, every single role. We have seen white artists play everything from trans to damn near Black. I mean, or an Asian, you know, if you look at it in Hollywood, on stage. And I think that now we're just looking at that opportunity of, of the veil being pulled back and opening up the doors for so many Black artists, Latin artists, Asian artists to open up and be able to just do the one thing we want to do, which is act. We just want to act. That's it. I'd add an Indigenous artists to that also. Yeah. Um, I, I, if I may, I would, I would just add, I mean, and, and I, and this is what's so great, right? Is sometimes I think in black theater, everybody gets lumped into like, you are black theater, but everybody's allowed their own opinion, right? Like we're not just one moving piece. And to that extent, um, and I appreciate that Malik said, I, I disagree, uh, which I, I, I am half and half in that sense, uh, because I think that it, in, 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 um, in the entirety of the speech that what he's trying to say is that we have to make space for other voices, right? Theaters that are in charge of uh, creating their season, the one person with their literary manager or their associates, those five, six, at a big institution, those five people that are making those choices don't always have the experience to, um, to really reach outside of somebody who's on already proven, right? And so what I get from when he puts that into the speech about not doing death of a sales cast of color and it black people, Asian people, white people, I'm sorry, not uh, Hispanics, an all gay version of death of a salesman. What I understand is that we each have our own understanding of that particular human experience and space needs to be made for that experience, right? And so we all, we are working from, so many different people are working from so many different places. Like I need a job, I gotta take care of my family. I chose to be an actor, I chose to be a writer, I chose to be a playwright. So his call to playwrights to come together. Like I have a friend, I was on a call in Chicago um, and it was two, three other black playwrights. Um, my friend brought us all together. Um, and she talked about how all of her plays have been produced at predominantly white theaters. But she always wondered like, why aren't black theaters calling me? Why aren't they calling me? Um, and she says, you know, because sometimes it's because my plays have white people in them. Plays have in them. My plays, so it's the types of black theaters and, and understanding what those spaces are. And, and there just needs to be more room for more different kinds of understandings of what it is to be a person of color. Um, I was just, just very quickly, um, there in, in small theater, there are 44 theaters that signed this, you know, LA theater will, will live. Um, and in the same way, you know, there's 66 Lord theaters that he was speaking to in his speech. There was one black, um, one black theater that's, that was identified as a Lord theater. Even in our situation here in LA, there's like out of 44, there's like five who signed this thing. Do you know what I mean? So even within LA, there's not space. Um, so I hear as an artist, like, yes, I'm gonna do that play. 
And then as a theater maker, no, we should not be doing that play. Let's do, let's do something else that still speaks to that common ground, that common experience so that I don't get on stage and go, and I've played roles where it's written for a white person and go, mm, I don't feel right. We talk about this, but I had a conversation. I was able to have that conversation with the playwright. Do you know what I mean? Which is a different thing than something that's already been published and put out there. So um, I definitely see both sides from the big vision and the and the more smaller vision. I just want to offer too. Um, gosh, there's so many different threads. We could go in so many different directions here. But one thing that's just popping for me is um, as we, or as I say or hear myself say, in addition to classics and great theater written by white folks, I also want to hear stories about and written by and for communities of color. Um, I also recognize as an audience member and as an artist who sees a lot of theater every year, I am done with plays that orbit around cultural trauma. I am, I am feeling that I've seen so much, so many Latinx plays about Latinx trauma, about ICE, for example, and that is an important voice to be a part of the Latinx theater canon, but it shouldn't be the only voice that gets elevated onto our stages. And I'll just briefly offer that there was a period of years, multiple years, where I thought to myself, every play I've seen in Los Angeles on small theaters and large theaters has been about, that have been about people of color or about people of color at work serving white people in service of white people. And I just had enough of the busboys and the maids and the gardeners. And there was one play about people of color that I finally saw where it took place in their living room. And it, it was, it was um, unbelievable how long I had to wait for that to take place on stage. So I know we have a lot to say about all of this, but I'm also looking at, at the time in, in awe of how quickly time flies. Um, I recognize that the four of you are in unique positions because you carry positions of leadership, of power within the theater community. And I wonder, we certainly can't unpack all of this in our final few minutes, but what do you wanna see from here? Whether that's for the American theater, for Los Angeles theater, for black theater, whatever, however you choose to interpret that, que that question, what do you wanna see moving forward? Um, let's begin with Nancy, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Um, I would like to see more people of color creating more work and creating more organizations to Yvonne's point of five or so BIPOC theaters still. Again, we're 27 years old, um, but again, that speaks to funding because being in that position of trying to find the money for that play, to hire that playwright, you know, that we would like to hire. Um, it speaks to that. I would like to see more funding for theater in general. I would like to see more funding for um, Los Angeles theaters. And I would like to see us come together. Uh, that's a, you know, a whole nother conversation. Um, nationally, I just think it has opened up this conversation of what has been going on behind the curtain, as it were, um, that needs to be addressed and for people to be honest and to, again, start telling more stories of the shared history, because that's the other thing, you know, Town Street, someone had said, oh, well, you know, if I'm white, can I work in your company? I'm like, are you kidding me? Our stories are complex and they're mixed together. This is a shared history in America. So I would like to see nationally and locally more stories of the shared history and giving voice to all those who are part of this great American experiment. Thank you so much, Nancy. And for anyone who doesn't know what BIPOC means, who's watching Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Uh, Malik, would you like to go next? Sure thing. Uh, I would like for the more well-established, um, better funded theaters to eliminate the need for a griot theater. Mm. In order to do that, that means, and, and what I mean by that is griot theater exists because there is a need that is not being met by larger, more well-established theaters today. I, I want traditional theaters to eliminate the need to have a special place to come to see these stories and to see these bodies on, your, on the stage. In order for them to get there, 
we have to move beyond the idea that you can program your way out of the problem. That you can still have a board that is largely white and male. You can still have senior leaders that are largely white and male, sometimes female, white females as well. Um, that you can have creative teams that are largely white make all of these decisions about how one is going to be inclusive in your programming. In order to eliminate the need for a gray old theater, that means it has to start at the top. It means that these organizations have to recruit board members who reflect the diversity that they say they want to see on their stages. You cannot program your way out of the problem. You have to change your institution. That means your board. That means your senior leaders. That means not just looking at the actors who are on stage. That means looking at the lighting designers, the sound designers, the costume designers, the dramaturge. That means looking at, at your technical team, your production manager. It means that it has to be embedded into our DNA. And once we achieve that, we no longer need a griot theater. Um, we are far from that place, but that's the place I would like us to get to. Thank you so much, Malik. Wow. Yvonne, what would you like to see? Um, I would like to see for, I would like to see, and it's one of the things that Lord Death is working on, um, is I would like to see more plays commissioned by people of color and women. I'd like, and then, and not just commissioned, I want the plays done. I want there to be a commitment to it getting its first production um, and, and space being created for those, for that voice to be um, curated. And I, and I do think that, you know, to Malik's point about the board um, and about other theaters that, were, that are getting these huge grants, you know, they're getting whatever, hundred thousand dollars and my company's getting 25,000, right? Um, but I'm the one, we are the ones who are working on those voices. We're the ones that are, uh, you know, doing our cycle of violence. We just did our pandemic plays where we brought together, uh, we just did it last week. We did, we brought 10 playwrights from across the country, LA, uh, Minnesota, uh, Chicago, you no, know, LA, Minnesota, and New York. And then we had actors from all across the country, all people of color. Uh, one person who's uh, indigenous, one person who uh, is Southeast Asian. And, and then we had a white woman, we had a black woman, we were old, we had young. And I, so I want there within the culture of your conversation to be able to speak about all stories. Um, one other thing I would say in terms of the board of what you were saying, um, if, if, if somebody like these kind of prestigious boards uh, at the Geffen or maybe even at Boston Courts or CTG, that if you're going to allow that person to be on your board, I would, I would actually not like to see theaters like ours disappear, like Griot Theater or, or our theater or any of the, uh, you know, I wouldn't want any of those to just disappear. Those board members should come into that space having their little theater company that needs help. <laughs> they should bring all the resources within that room to the little theater that is still trying to survive, right? That's how you're gonna grow those things. It's not by us disappearing, it's by that board member. If you truly are there, not just to have your hookups and talk to people to build your business or to go up the societal, societal ranks, what you're gonna do, you can't come onto this board unless you can name and bring with you one smaller theater that you are trying to cultivate. That's what I would like to see because then there would be real change. There's so much power in those rooms um, and it challenges people to be on a board because they're there for the arts or are you there, you know, to get that, you know, $500 of chicken rice, whatever that is. So um, I think that that's how you can make real change in terms of dividing those dollars. Um, you can't be here unless you're for someone else as well. Thank you, Yvonne. Abby. Oh my God. So for me, I'm glad I'm last because y'all know I can talk. So when it looks, this is how it is for me. Opening up space for not only BIPOC, but LGBTQIA, but especially trans artists, non-binary artists that are there, that have the talent, that can do the work. And 
it's it's very interesting in in our new movement of all Black Lives Matter and BLM and all of that, how much we disassociate with even Black theater, Black queer people within that theater spectrum. So I want to see that expansion go beyond just Black folks, but black, all Black folks, all Black queer folks are inclusive in that. Hire trans women for those roles. Hire trans men. Hire gender non-conforming, gender non-binary. Hire them based on their talents because they're good and they're there and they need to be seen and heard and part of your companies. They need to be part of these companies right now because not a lot of companies have trans and non-binary people within their structures and opening up that. And I love what Yvonne and Malik said about the board. Look at your board and challenge your board at what they are doing and what they are funding right now. I'm a board member of TCLA and I get in a lot of trouble for challenging them to put their money where their mouth is. Don't tell me you're going to do something and not do it just because you want to be, oh, I'm on the board of Trans Course of Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. I've dealt with TCLA, GMCLA, APAIT. I want my board to do the work, to work towards that expansion, that diversity that they say they are doing. So it's up to each one of us to also challenge our board members to say, hey, you need to put in some more work when it comes to fundraising and diversification and what communities you're going in, where programming is coming from. Help us because this is part of the American experience. It's part of all of our story. We are all part of this country. And though I am African-American, Muslim American, queer American, you know, all these different facets, at the end of the day, it's America. And my America has been so diverse and not all one thing since I was a child. So we are at the beginning of that. Let's keep that expansion going so our grandchildren, nieces and nephews and younger ones don't have to go through what we're going through now, especially artistically. I want it open to where every kid, every person can audition for these roles, whether, when's the last time you saw a Black Annie? She's an orphan. She doesn't have to be white. They just keep making her white. She is an orphan. She has no family. She could be from Rwanda. Let's do that. Let's make a Black Annie. You know, noise within. There you go. Your next show, Jonathan. Here we go for the next season. Annie, wonderful. I, I am in awe of all of you. I'm so grateful to share this space with all of you. I am a huge, huge fan of all of your companies. And for everyone watching at home all over, please, please join us at A Noise Within the next time we partner with each of these four amazing organizations. And more importantly, please go to their websites and attend their organization's events. They're doing virtual events now, many of them. And more importantly, give to these organizations, Grio Theater, Town Street Theater, uh, uh, Lower Depth Theater, Trans Chorus of Los Angeles. Give, please, to these incredible organizations um, because they're doing really wonderful work. So a huge thank you to the four of you. It's an honor to share space. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna pop back on Jeff and Julia when they're ready. Thank you for having us. You all are extraordinary. Yvonne, Nancy, Abby, Malik, we're so grateful that you came on. Everybody listening, please support these folks. They're extraordinary. I could listen to you all for hours. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jonathan. Wonderful job. Uh, and again, thank, thank you for sharing your talent uh, and your thoughts with us. And, and we look forward to, uh, to future collaborations. Uh, we're going to close our uh, Fridays at five as what has become a tradition by reading uh, names of, of donors that have supported our virtual gala, our Rise Together campaign, and as well as purchased a subscription to our upcoming season. Uh, thank you for your support. Uh, you're keeping the organization alive and, and healthy during this uh, 
very challenging time. So here we go. Thank you to Bob Hamill, Richard Hamilton, Linda J. Harris, Rita and Stephen Harwood, Jesse and Yolanda Hathaway, William and Bernhild Heckman, Michael Hegeman, Sherry G. Hepp, Nikki Heskin, Elizabeth Higgins, Laurel Hill, Linda Hogue. Thank you to Evelyn Hoffman, Jim and Arlene Hogan, Kelly Hogan, Jean Holloway, Jennifer Holtzman, Dr. Patricia Hoppy, Kevin Hops, Daniel Hoskins, Aaron Horthen, Carol Howell, Cheryl and Glenn Huckel, and John and Linda Hutnick. A huge thank you to Harold Huffer, Lenny Holtstrom, Martha Hunter, Doug Hutchinson, Mark Irvine, Jennifer and Robert Israel, Tom Jacobson and Ramon Munoz, Donna and Jeff Zappi, Robert Jameson, Adolf Gasso, Ryan and Denise J, Kathleen Jenkins Williams, and Beatrice Jennings. Thank you all so much for supporting a noise with them. Thank, thank you, you all. This was a this was such an exciting Fridays at five. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you everybody for watching and supporting. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone.